Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now to meet in order to praise and worship you. We pray that you would come and you would meet us and that you would speak to us uh, through this time of worship, that you would prepare a message directly for each and every single one of us. And may we just return this joy to you. In your name we pray, amen. It's our children's time. <laughs> How are y'all doing this morning? You doing okay? Are you awake? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> it's good to see you. I was wondering, so what I have right here, this is my wife Sharon's, uh, this is her baby blanket. Her great-grandmother made this, like sewed this together. And it might, you know, look, look like much. We're trying to figure out if these are, what, roses or strawberries or something. We still don't know what they are. Uh, but it's got this pattern. 
and her, her so her great grandmother made this. Do, do you think it took a lot of care for this thing to still be here? Yeah, somebody took care of this right for a long time, and it, that's not easy because Sharon wore this thing out. Like she, this was her favorite blanket. She took it everywhere, drug it along like it was getting frayed on the edges. And one of the thing that's, things that is really cool is uh, not that long ago, right before my son was born, her mom took it and got it uh, remade. Got a whole new piece of fabric on the, on the back side and made it to where she has her favorite blanket again. Do, do any of you have a favorite blanket? Yeah? Okay. So, so imagine like, yeah, right there. Everywhere you go, it's taken everywhere you go. And if that thing got destroyed, how would you feel? Yeah, destroyed, right? And so it takes a lot of care to keep these things nice. And that's one of the things that God really wants us to do. He wants us to be able to take, be good stewards, to take care of the things that he's given us. Because, you know, if you have something, you want to keep it, right? God not only wants us to be able to keep our things, but he also wants us to be able to take care of other people because they are his and he loves them. And so it really matters how we take care of things, how we take care of people and how we steward these things. Make sense? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you you care about us, that you, you want us to be able to stay with you for a long time to last, that you, you care about what we care about. And we just pray that you would help us to be good stewards, to take care of what you have given us. In your name we pray, amen. Let's pray over the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us this, this money to be able to be good stewards of it so that we can give it back to you and take care of it, that you trust us. And we just pray that you would bless this, this offering and use it to 
expand your kingdom to do your will, to take care of the sick, the needy, the poor, and uh, to take care of this facility. We love you, Lord. In your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Lovely. That was lovely. Thank you. Well, you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Esther, chapter 2, verse 5. I'm going to go back to the Old Testament for a little bit. Now, last week, I went over some things to help us set and reach our goals. And I hope that most of you were able to set a goal and, uh, or at least start in the plan to try to reach it. And uh, I outlined five areas where we as Christians can work on our relationship with the Lord. That is Bible reading, prayer, stewardship, worship, and evangelism. Now, it might shock you, or it might not shock you at all, that in addition to these being personal goals that I would like for us to set for ourselves, find one of these and work on it over the next year, these five areas are actually also a place where I, places where I want to see this church as a whole grow. These are actually my goals for this year for Stephen Green Baptist Church, that we would grow in our Bible reading, our prayer, our stewardship, our worship, and our evangelism. And as a result, we will grow closer to the Lord. And so when I was trying to figure out, okay, where does the Lord want us to go next? He led me to the book of Esther. And I went, okay, well, that's interesting because the book of Esther, God is not mentioned at all. It's very odd. But it is still inspired scripture. It's, it's still in here for a reason because God has seen working throughout it. And so it's, it's a very interesting case study to look at it because what do you do? How do you keep things going when God is silent and he doesn't seem to be anywhere? And so I was really looking at the book of Esther and I said, hey, this entire book is about stewardship. Surprise, surprise. So... While Esther is chronologically one of the last books of the Old Testament that takes place in the exile, just a little bit after the book of Daniel, and right around the same time as the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, that's why it's kind of grouped together with those two. And so this is around 486 BC in Persia. So this is not in Israel at all. They're, in, they're still in exile, which might explain one of the reasons that God isn't really mentioned He's kind of handed the people over to their sins to be captive to these other people, just like he said he would do if they ever broke the covenant. Now he hasn't given up on them, and that's what this entire book is about. But you might notice as you read this book that there is a lot of tension in all of the main characters, because every single main character in this book is in some kind of a power struggle. They're trying to figure out how do I work with this power? How do I get this power? How do I retain this power? How do I use it? And so there's a lot to be said about how these characters handle their jobs, their relationships with others, and the problems that arise within it. And I think it, it's actually fairly relevant to us today. And so what I want, it's my belief that we can glean wisdom on how to become good stewards from this story. And so... A little bit of background. You might notice I'm starting in chapter 2, but we're going to be dealing a little bit with chapter 1. So, background. In the first chapter, we are introduced to the king of Persia, Akashurus. Okay, that's a mouthful. Uh, it is believed, most scholars think that this is actually the ancient Persian emperor Xerxes. Uh, Probably best known to us as the guy who fought 300 Spartans, led by King Leonidas, uh, in the Battle of Thermopylae. They made a movie about it several years ago. If you've seen it, yeah, okay, watch the TV version. Uh, very different portrayal, but he, he's portrayed as this guy who is very arrogant, very like almost wants to become a, wants to be a god in that in that movie. And there's also a movie out there called One Night with the King. You might have seen it. This is also the same guy. In fact, if you watch those two movies back to back, you wouldn't get the same image of this guy. Uh, but what does the Bible say about him? It says that in Esther 1.1 that he had 127 provinces. 
from the Indus River all the way to Kush, which is modern day Ethiopia. So pretty much from Egypt, Egypt to India, Persia expanded 127 provinces. This is not a small kingdom. In fact, this is one of the kingdoms that the only people that could really take them out was Rome. And so this is large. This man has stewarded pretty well, right? To be able to get an empire this large. So he decides in the first chapter that he's going to throw a week-long banquet. He's, he's been emperor about three years. He's gained some territory, and he's really proud of himself. So he throws a, a week-long banquet. And it says that this was for princes, attendants, and any army officers. This is anyone he personally employs. This is a, this is a business party. Hey, we had a great year. Let's celebrate. And so... He wants to, sh the point of this is he wants to show off his progress. He wants to show off his bling. He wants to show off his swag. Like, this is the stuff we got. This is, we're doing great. Don't I look good? I am leading this place really great. And so, by the end of the feast on the seventh day, after a little bit of drinking, remember, this is not, <laughs> this, is, this is a pagan empire. He's just going to do whatever he wants. After a little bit of drinking, he decides, well, okay, I've been showing off all my, you know, my empire, my riches, my glory. I want to show off my beautiful wife. And so he pretty much commands his wife, Vashti, hey, get dressed up, wear your crown, and I want you to come. And basically, I want to show you off to the empire because you are, like, that awesome. And so he sends seven of his servants to go get her. Now that seems a little excessive. We're, we're starting to see that he is a little bit of a micromanager, like he kind of wants to make sure that this is perfect. And what happens? She says, no, I'm not coming. Forget this. I'm not gonna come and pray it about to you. Now, we live in a different culture. <laughs> She was not really in a position to necessarily say no to him. This is like the equivalent of saying, the president saying, hey, my wife, I want to invite her and show her off to the UN and let them meet her. And she says no. It is embarrassing to him. It is all these things. Now, was this the proper place and time? Probably not. He had been partying a little too hard. But he still... She is making him look like a fool in front of the entire empire. So the interesting thing about this is he has this big, strong empire. And his wife saying no to him sets the whole empire on fire. <laughs> like it blows everything up. And so he goes to his advisors and they say, hey, you need to make a royal edict. Just get rid of her. What? Just get rid of her. So he does. And he says, all right, it's a royal decree. She can never come before me ever again. Never going to see her again. You're done. This is a permanent law that he cannot repeal. It's pretty harsh. And so after that, they declare, okay, she's going to be replaced. So the king's court starts find, searching for more suitors. You know, this is The Bachelor, 500 B.C. They start saying, okay, we need a new queen, and they start the search immediately. It takes them about four years to find a new queen. But they start, this, they start rounding up all the beautiful girls and saying, hey, you're in a contest. We're going to see which one of you is going to become the queen. And so it's at this point in the story that the two main characters I really want to deal with today are introduced, Mordecai and Esther. This is all background leading up to this point. This is the setup. And so I want us to notice as we read this story how Mordecai and Esther sort of run counter to Xerxes and Vashti in their decision making, in their stewardship. So looking at chapter 2, verse 5, let's read. In the fortress of Susa, there was a Jewish man named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei son of Kish, a Benjamite. 
he had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the other captives when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took King Jeconiah of Judah into exile. Mordecai was the legal guardian of his cousin Hasadah, that is Esther, because she didn't have a father or mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was extremely good looking. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her as his own daughter. So the first thing that we can see is why stewardship is responsible. Why stewardship does what needs to be done, not just, not just what it wants. Mordecai was an exiled Jew. His father was a Benjamite from Jerusalem. His ancestors were from Jerusalem, from Benjamin. And so we look at this and we say, all right, he'd been in, his family had been in exile for what, at, at least the second generation, if not all the way down to about maybe four or five generations. This means that he was carried, his, his ancestors were carried into exile by Babylon. Then Babylon got taken over by the Median Empire. And then the Medes got taken over by the Persians. And so they have passed hands into three different empires at this point. Oh, well, these are these people that you have taken as slaves. Let's just hand them over to you. Three times. And there's no hope of them going back, right? But then all of a sudden, as we read over in Ezra, and at the end of Daniel, it is Darius, Xerxes' father, who says, you can go back to Jerusalem and rebuild it. And so at this point, it is most likely that a certain select section of Jews had started to go back and rebuild Jerusalem under the assistance of Persian Empire, believe it or not. And so, my point is here, this calls Mordecai an exiled Jew. Three or four generations, and he has kept his Jewish ancestry. He did not assimilate. If you're living somewhere long enough, you start to become like that culture. And he was responsible enough to say, no, I'm Jewish. I'm sticking this. I do not belong here. I am in this culture. I am not of it. I am something else. He is responsible. Another thing that we see from him, from Mordecai, is he was raising Esther, his orphaned cousin, as his own daughter. She was an orphan. And so when she was orphaned, he said, I'll take her in. No problem. You're mine. I will love you like my own daughter. Now, we don't even know if he had a family. We don't know if he had a wife or kids. We don't know if, you know, just serving in the empire, that wasn't something he was going to have. But he, he sees this opportunity, and he doesn't see this as a burden. He says, oh, she's going to be like my own daughter. He's a very responsible man. In comparison, King Xerxes seems to be micromanaging his empire. Everything has to be to a T, the way I want it. My wife said no to me, I'm getting rid of her. It, it, it is something to be said. When people try to micromanage something, they usually can't keep control of it at all. And so with this book, there's actually the kind of humor in this, that the more that Xerxes tries to control his empire, the more he actually proves that he doesn't have control over it at all. And it's, it's, it's funny, it's ironic. As, as tragic as this book is, there is actual humor in it because the powerful are not actually that powerful. So look at this. Xerxes seems strong and responsible, but one person not doing what he wants is a threat to the entire social order. Notice in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 18, how terrified they are that all women will look at Vashti and say, oh, they're going to use her as an excuse not to, not to listen to us at all. Like the women are just going to completely overthrow the entire Persian Empire overnight because Vashti said no one time. <laughs> He's paranoid. This is weak. He is not responsible at all. He's actually saying it's her fault 
not mine, that I can't keep my house in order. How do we deal with our responsibilities reveals our character. Wise character takes responsibility while foolish character passes the blame on someone else. This goes for our jobs as well as our family relationships. Are you the kind of person that will take on responsibility like Mordecai when it falls into your lap? Say, hey, I got this, I'll take it. Or are you the kind of person like Xerxes who destroys relationships because he gets upset and doesn't get his way and ultimately feels that he is not responsible to even try to fix it? By the way, if you're thinking of someone else right now, you might be trying to deflect your responsibility onto someone else. Take responsibility for your actions. So we see that wise stewardship is responsible. But what does it do with these responsibilities? How does it take care of them? We also see that wise stewardship is devoted. If we go down to verse 8, when the king's command and edict became public knowledge, many young women were gathered in the fortress of Susa under Hegai's care. Esther was also taken into the palace and placed under the care of Hegai, who was in charge of the women. The young woman pleased him and gained his favor so that he accelerated the process of the beauty treatments and the special diet that she received. He assigned seven hand-picked female servants to her from the palace and transferred her and her servants to the harem's best quarters. Esther did not reveal her ethnic background or her birthplace because Mordecai had ordered her not to. Every day, Mordecai took a walk in front of the harem's courtyard to learn how Esther was doing and to see what was happening to her. Why stewardship is devoted. Look at what Mordecai was doing here. Every day, he would go and he would walk into the front courtyard and he would say, where's Esther? How's she doing? This is my daughter. How is she? Is she doing okay? Are they treating her all right in there? He cared so much. He was there every day checking on her. He's being a good, good steward of his relationship with his adopted daughter. Not only that, we see something else. The servant, Haggai, he's in charge of making sure that these women get pretty. He, he, he's kind of the, uh, was it, beautician? Said that wrong? He's the person in charge of making sure that these women are, are looking just stellar for the king. And so he is trying to be a good steward of what he has, and he sees Esther, and he says, whoa, you're awesome. Uh, you're so great. Uh, these like six months of beauty treatments that we're going to give you, like I'm gonna accelerate them. Not only that, I like you enough, I'm gonna move you up to the penthouse because I think you've really got a shot at this. It gave her seven servants. <laughs> like, he gives her the royal treatment right off the bat because, oh, I like you. He's being a good steward because he wants to make his master happy. But notice Vashti, she didn't seem too devoted to her husband. When he called upon her, she didn't even go see what he wanted. She flat out refused him. She jumped on the opportunity to make him look like a fool. And then Xerxes, in response, jumped at the chance to have revenge on her, get rid of her and replace her. This is not devotion or care. This is not good stewardship. What we care for and how we take care of it reveals our priorities in our heart. We will always find time to take care of what we truly value. We will find a way. Mordecai valued his relationship with his cousin Esther so much he was there every day. Haggai valued doing his job well. Vashti valued her ability to say no. And Xerxes valued his pride and his power enough so that he let one temporary argument turn into a permanent relationship barrier. You're out of here. What we care for and how we care for it reveals our heart and our character. So speaking of how we care for something, it also matters who we listen to. 
The third thing we see is wise stewardship listens to good counsel, good advice. This takes humility and discernment. Look at verse 10. It says that Esther listened to Mordecai. We also, if we skip down to verse 20, Esther still had not revealed her birthplace or her ethnic background as Mordecai had directed. She obeyed Mordecai's orders as she always had while he raised her. So throughout this entire process, he said, don't reveal that you're a Jew. There's value in them not knowing. And she listens to him. Now, they don't know how they're going to be treated because they're, they're a subservient people. These aren't the people who enslaved them, but they're still not like your best friends. And so they don't know how they're going to be treated if she reveals that she is Jewish. Oh, sorry, you're out of the running now. So Mordecai says, sit on it for now. And she obeys. But we also see that she listened to Haggai. In verse 9, it says, if I can catch myself, the young woman pleased him, Haggai, and gained his favor that he has celebrated the process. It says Esther, verse 12, during the year before each young woman's turn to go to the king, Azarus, the harem regulation required her to receive beauty treatments with oil and myrrh for six months and then with perfumes and cosmetics for another six months. When the young woman would go to the king, she was given whatever she requested to take her from the harem to the palace. She would go in the evening and in the morning she would return to a second harem under the supervision of Sha'agash, the king's eunuch in charge of the concubines. She never went to the king again unless he desired to summon her by name. So this king, you have one shot, one night to impress him. This really is The Bachelor. I don't watch it. But this is my impression of it. If, never mind. But you have one shot, that's it. If he doesn't like you, the end. Verse 15, Esther was the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, and the uncle Mordecai who adopted her his own daughter, when her turn came to go to the king, she did not ask for anything except what Haggai, the king's trusted official in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won approval in the sight of everyone who saw her. So she was allowed to make herself more beautiful. She was allowed some extra flair. She was allowed to make herself like, oh, well, this is the king once, but, you know, if you want to go the extra step, go ahead. And she said, no, no, no. She goes to the king's servant and says, you know him best. What does he like? This is what you like. She goes, okay, I'm not doing anything more than that. She listened to him, and it paid off. That's good counsel. Now compare this with the king in taking the advice of his counselors in chapter 1, verse 13. He was considering what to do with Vashti, maybe even considering to take her back. But he goes and he says, what do you think I should do? And they say, you need to get rid of her. There are friends out there that might tell you if you're going through relationship problems, maybe you should just get rid of them. That's bad advice. In fact, you notice what his advisors did. They made this a law that even the king could not take back. This is a royal decree. It's something that once the king makes it, even the king can't touch it or repeal it. And this is actually going to play out later in this book. That's like, you know, using a sledgehammer to kill a cockroach. It's excessive. And so these are, these are not good counselors. You need to be careful who you listen to. Who you listen to is important. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, without guidance, people fall. But with many counselors, there is deliverance. Many counselors are good because you get an over idea, overarching idea of what? A vast amount of wisdom. If somebody says no to you, hey, good job. They're, they're actually giving you probably decent counsel. They're not just telling you what you want to hear. Sometimes good counsel stings. And that's why you need it. Asahurus was so scared that the entire empire might find out that he can't even control his own house. So his advisors make sure, made sure that he issues a law that tells the empire exactly that. This seems like a very dumb and arrogant move, right? I don't want people to know that my wife said no to me, so I'm going to make it a law that no wives can say no to anybody ever. And they're all going to find out that my wife said no to me. 
You don't want somebody to find out something. You don't go and tell everybody that's exactly what happened. <laughs> but look on the other hand. Mordecai is expressing his humility and his discernment by saying, let's not reveal our Jewishness. We're not there yet. There's arrogance over here and there's humility over here. When the time comes, then we'll say, this will come into play more next week, but the rest of this book kind of hinges on the wisdom of Mordecai's advice. So in the same way, there are lead, people who will lead us to good counsel and lead us in awful counsel. Hang out with the people that make you a better person. If you're not hanging out with people that make you better, why are you hanging out with them? Hang out with people of good character, and you will develop good character. So through it all, Mordecai was dedicated, and he was sitting at the king's gate, checking on Esther. We don't know if he had a job there, or he just had time, or on his hands, maybe he was retired. Sometimes you're just in the right place at the right time. We see something interesting happen in verse 21. During those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Big Than of Teresh, two eunuchs who guarded the king's entrance, became infuriated and planned to assassinate King Asahurus. When Mordecai learned of the plot, he reported it to Queen Esther. She became queen. And he told the king on Mordecai's behalf, when the report was investigated and verified, both men were hanged on the gallows. This event was recorded in the historical record in the king's presence. So, because of her obedience, Esther gained the favor of the king. Her one night, her one shot, she made it. And as a result of his devotion, Mordecai's coming in to check on her, and he discovers this plot that the king is going to be assassinated by his own guards. Like, these are the people you should trust the most of anybody, right? The last thing we see is that wise stewardship is just. Mordecai acted to save the life of the king, and arguably this could have been a way to get revenge on an empire that was enslaving his people. But he remained a trusted servant and said, you know what, he doesn't deserve this, I am going to tell him about it. He tells Esther, she tells, gets the word to the king, the assassination attempt is foiled. Imagine if the Secret Service started a plot against the President of the United States. Any United States President. Like, that is like the lowest of the low, right? These are your own people. It's not just. Looking at our stewardship, Here's a little story. You ever, you ever hear of any people that didn't just do a good job with stewardship, like people that won the lottery, didn't do a good job with it? Here's a story. In 2002, West Virginia building contractor Andrew Jackson Whitaker Jr. won a $315 million multi-state Powerball draw. And after taxes, he walked away with $114 million of it. That was just about his last stroke of good fortune. Thieves ran off with 545000 that he had stashed in his car in 2003. And a year later, his car got robbed again for $200,000. He didn't learn the first time. And so then, he was later sued by Caesars in Atlantic City from gambling, in which they said he had bounced a $1.5 million check and so within four years, his entire fortune was gone. $114 million. Did not steward it well. How we take care of things matter. How we take care of people matter. How we take care of God's things matter. And guess what? We're all. First Corinthians four two. In this regard, it is expected of stewards that each one of them to be found faithful. Verse one: A person should consider us in this way as servants of Christ and managers of God's mysteries. 
there's some people out here who are not being, in, in, in this room, who are not being responsible, who are not being devoted. It might be a wife, it might be a husband. Maybe you're listening to bad advice. Maybe you're listening to no advice, just doing what you want. Maybe you're on the verge of a, a relationship and you're saying, I don't need to stay in this. Maybe you think you're writing an argument and you just want to win. Stewardship is about character. It's about our character. If you have character, you will be a good steward. If you have bad character, you will be a bad steward. It's a hard issue. Stewardship is not just about character, it's about reflecting God's character. We take care of God's things because God takes care of his things. What do we need to take care of this morning? What do you need to take care of this morning? like to talk with me or pray, I'll be around, but let's bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the events of Esther that we can learn so much from how you take care of things. And I just pray that you would give us the strength, the courage to take care of your things, to take care of people, to take care of just life. Be with us as we go from here and bless this week. In your name we pray, amen.